Welcome to this episode of the Sea Trade Maritime In Conversation series. My name is Emma Howe, Director of Content at Sea Trade Maritime. Today we have the pleasure of speaking with Antonios Trakakis, Technical Director Marine at RENA. Antonios has long been an advocator of LNG as the optimum fuel selection for new vessels. And today we dig a little deeper into why hydrogen is a fuel solution for meeting IMO 250 targets. Welcome, Antonios. Thank you very much for the hospitality. So you've been quoted as saying that LNG as fuel emerges as, as the optimum fuel selection for new vessels because it's available and offers an immediate and notable reduction of GHG emissions. Being fossil, it isn't the end of the road, but can be reformed to hydrogen on board a ship. This progressive replacement of LNG from H2 provides a continuous path for compliance. Antonius, today, can you talk us through this and how this will offer a reduction in GHG emissions? Well, Emma, in your question, there are a few, let's say, words that have significance more than others. And this is the progressive reduction and the immediate reduction. That is, we are requested to go from a level of emissions that has, as a reference, 2008, to arrive to net zero in 2015. This means that we must have a progressive reduction of emissions. Therefore, the more we delay to start our reduction, the steeper the reduction will be thereafter. This means that starting with LNG gives us the minimum possible slope because it offers an immediate reduction of CO2 emissions. And therefore, the measures we will have to take later in the future will be easier. We will not have to exaggerate the solutions possibly as if we would start with the heavy fuel oil and running at high speeds. Therefore, LNG does offer a significant reduction of emissions, even in CO2 equivalent emissions. We hear very rightly the concern, the rising concerns about methane slip, but this is something which is today handled extremely well from technology. And we have to bear always in mind that technology has been there to help humanity in dealing with many challenges. Fugitive emissions of methane are indeed a huge concern for the environment, but technology is again there to tackle them. And I believe that national regulations will also minimize the fugitive emissions at the point of source, at their production. Therefore, the LNG does offer a significant reduction of CO2 or greenhouse emissions, CO2 equivalent emissions, and this allows us to go further in time as if we were starting our process now with heavy fuel oil. Now, arriving further in time has many possible advantages. In case that the, the availability of alternative fuel or any other sources which can decarbonize us will not be available by then, an owner will have the possibility to continue running on a fossil fuel and transform it on board to hydrogen. How this is done? This is actually not a novel technology. It is a, a novel application of an existing technology because steam reforming of methane is how 90% of hydrogen on Earth is produced today. The technology is very mature, is fully developed, and can be equally well applied on board the ship. It is a kind of pre-combustion technology in the sense that we split the molecule of a hydrocarbon, in our case CH4, to hydrogen, which then can be used immediately as fuel to internal combustion engines or fuel cells or both and reserves the carbon atom as CO2. Therefore, the ship will have the opportunity and the capability to banker at all times with an existing fossil fuel LNG and transform it on board to hydrogen. The rate of production will depend on how far the owner wishes to be ahead of compliance and competition. Now, in case in 2035 that is uh, when LNG can take us safely without any other technological modification on board. There are solutions that will take us to 2050. An LNG fuel ship can be converted to that solutions, to these solutions, yet at the minimum possible extra cost. Therefore, for us, the view to LNG and its transformation to hydrogen is seen under two different approaches. One is to have a continuous line 
with a minimum possible slope of reduction of greenhouse emissions. And the second is, what is the cost involved in this? Because the cost is something that the society will be asked to bear, and we want to be responsible against the society. We believe that this solution does have extra cost, but has the minimum extra cost among all other options. Thank you. That was extremely interesting start to our conversation and actually leads me well into the second question I wanted to talk about today. At the end of 2022, RENA announced the approval in principle of the first very large crude carrier VLCC vessel using an innovative propulsion arrangement that reduces the ship's resistance by 5 to 10 percent achieved by splitting the thrust of a single large propeller into two smaller ones, thus reducing the required ballast draft for the full propeller immersion, which in turn allows the reduction of volume of the ballast tanks and ultimately of the overall ship dimensions and the required power for propulsion without impacting the cargo carrying capacity. At the same time, the vessel will meet the IMO targets for 2050 through the use of the ship's fuel, combined with hydrogen produced on board. The LNG stroke hydrogen fueled vessel general arrangement developed by Shanghai Wagakwaiku Shipbuilding SWS is based on the result of a joint project with Marin, the Liberia administration, Vartzilla ABB and Helbio and RENA. Now, this is obviously a great example of how the gas reforming concept can work equally well on smaller or on this case, bigger vessels. Tell us a little bit more about this. The, the case of the VLCC is an example where at the request of a major energy supplier, former oil major, we had to develop a ship design of, for this ship type that would uh, minimize the consumption of fuel without giving attention to what kind of fuel. This is the right way to start the process of decarbonization because our primary target should be to minimize our energy consumption. This also for the whole of the society because apparently at a certain point in time we will have to change our needs and our demands for energy. Going back to this particular ship type, the idea was to maintain the volume dedicated for cargo tanks and minimize the volume around the cargo tanks, which is normally occupied by ballast water. So what we did, we succeeded to have the same cargo carrying capacity with a smaller vessel in overall. And of course, the less volume or the less weighted area, the less the ship resistance and the less the fuel consumption. And this was possible by, as you said very correctly, splitting the thrust of a big propeller into two smaller ones. And this is actually the approach that we are trying to follow in all cases, how to minimize the vessel's resistance where and if this is possible. So for our listeners today, could you go into a little bit more detail about how the new propulsion concept is important because it offers ship owners a way to exceed IMO 2050 carbon reduction targets using practical fuel and technology that is readily available today. And lastly, we have to note that this is a great collaboration and is collaboration key to achieve the common goal of the 2050 deadline? Emma, the challenge of reducing our emissions to net zero is very big and uh, we really have to revisit our practices and maintain our values. That is, we should not be expected to continue doing the same that we did for so many years when addressing these kind of challenges. The idea is that we have to revisit all our solutions and make sure they put them under consideration in a broader view perspective to see what is really best for this case. And we see that under the thrust of decarbonization, we are moved towards solutions that before we would never consider. For every change, we need a force, and decarbonization does provide the force to see new options that do make a lot of sense, like in the case of the VLCC or like in the case of so many other ships, for the combustion of hydrogen, where we really have to have an open mind and a very open approach 
so that we arrive at the, the new optimum. It's a new era, and we should not expect that in a, when we deal with new problems, we can use the same old solutions. We should not try to put an elephant in a mini. We should be open to find new, elegant solutions, perfectly suitable and applicable to the new situations and conditions. The, the collaboration is really important. The decarbonization is bigger than every and each of us. This is not something that a single person or a single organization can do alone effectively. We have to work all together and we have to visit all the aspects of decarbonization. What is really left somehow outside of the radar of shipping is that we have not really appreciated that the challenge of decarbonization falls ashore in preparing the solutions that will be used on board. Experience shows that on board ships, we can use and apply all technologies that from time to time were introduced in shipping. There are numerous examples that the ships were converted, adjusted, modified, or installed with new machinery in line with energy saving or new regulations. What we have to be very careful is how we will provide to the ships the solution needed and which solution we, we have to, to apply. This is extremely important. And for us, the focus that we give on LNG is because we are trying to be prudent, as most of the ship owners are, not conservative, prudent, because by doing this, we want to make sure that the challenge of decarbonization will be met and our task will be done nicely and in a cost-effective manner. Continuing to run on an existing fossil fuel is something that we can start immediately. There is no good reason to delay anymore. The, the faster we start, the, the further we can go and with a minimum co cost. Therefore, using available sources is certainly that makes full sense. And available sources means that the society will not have to prepare extra infrastructure for new solutions, which will come at a very high cost, and this will dictate a lot of time to prepare the solution, especially if this solution is meant only for shipping, not for other industries. Antonius, you've talked about this being a new era for the society and the industry. But as we reach towards the end of 2023, tell us a little bit around what have been the key successes for RENA. And let's have a look at what 2024 might bring as well. For us, it has been very important to convince ourselves that our proposal makes sense because we respect very much the shipping community. We respect very much the level of knowledge and expertise of ship owners. Actually, I have been working with them for 27 years before joining RINA, and uh, I would never dare to go to them with a solution that people can uh, reject easily. What we have tried to do is to, to compare, to make a crash test of our pro proposal, to actually to make several crash tests and convince ourselves that this, yes, has a meaning. Of course, we don't have the crystal ball to know what the future will bring. This is impossible. But we believe that our solution has a very big flexibility in the sense that an energy fuel ship can very easily accommodate any solution that the future might bring. And if the future does not bring a really disruptive solution, as we said before, this, the owner of the ship can continue running on LNG and transforming it into hydrogen. So for us, it has been very rewarding that after convincing ourselves, we succeeded to convince uh, several shipyards, ship designers and owners to start working with us. And uh, we do hope and expect that this extensive cooperation that we have started with many ship owners and designers and yards will uh, bring fruitful results in the next year. So let's turn our eyes towards the United Arab Emirates and um, in the next few weeks, COP28 is taking place. And obviously there is a big focus on decarbonisation as part of those conversations. Antonius, what would you personally like to see come from COP28? I would be extremely happy if there is a consensus because decarbonisation does not really depend on uh, each and every initiative, but requires a well-orchestrated series of actions. 
we have to agree the next actions to be done and I would be extremely more happy to see them being implemented. And last but not least, you talked a little bit earlier about being for over 27 years with ship owners before joining RENA. Without putting an age to yourself, could you tell us a little bit about your career to date? Because it sounds fascinating and how you've ended up in the role you are now. 58 years old. I started in uh, 1993 after completing my studies in Greece and abroad. My first uh, job was uh, a seaman. I started as, as a seaman on board ships. Then I moved to ashore to shipping companies. Uh, my first job was um, coordinator in spare parts. And then progressively I moved to spare part manager, assistant superintendent, superintendent, technical manager, chief technology officer, and then I moved to RINA's technical director marine. I had the luck, I had the big opportunity to go through all the levels, all the different tasks within the technical department of a shipping company. I understand exactly what are the concerns of the people ashore and on board, because all my life I have been dealing with seamen, captains and chief engineers. Being a seaman myself, I know very well how they think, what are their concerns, and I dedicated so many years of my life to help and support them. And as a final note, what would you say to anybody graduating and thinking about entering the maritime sector? MIT is a wonderful sector. For me, the, my job made it possible to go to many places. Although, to be honest, what has, I managed to see is mostly airports and uh, ports. I have not seen a lot of museums or other <laughs> cities, but the possibility to be in contact with so many people of so many different expertise and so many different way of thinking has been the most beautiful and wonderful trip in my life. The experience of interacting with so many people in all places of Earth. Great. Thank you, Antonios. It's been fascinating to talk to you today and I'm sure our listeners will appreciate all that we've discussed. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Emma. Thank you very much for the opportunity and very much appreciate this opportunity given to me.